Hey guys, Crypto Lazy Geek here and welcome back to the channel. Tonight, we are going to be comparing how my imaging and my astrography compares when I imaging from my rooftop balcony here in Tokyo. So Bortle 8-9 zone, very light, lots of light pollution, it's amazing. <laughs> and when I take the same telescopes to a much darker area, which is in Yamanashi Prefecture, and it's a Bortle 4 zone. And we're gonna take images of the same target on the same night. I've actually already taken uh, the, the images of M31 and M33 with two telescopes over in that Bortle 4 zone. And now I'm going to do the same here in that uh, Bortle uh, 9 or 8 zone and we'll be comparing the results in the end. I've already filmed in the Bortle uh, 4 zone. I didn't expect to actually be retaking the same thing here. So I'm reshooting this introduction. So if there's some repetition, but I'll be taking pictures of M33 with the Sea Star, M31 with the Dwarf 2 telescope here. And we'll see what gives between Bortle 9 and Bortle 4. So anyway, let me hand you over to Quiff from the past for the Bortle 4 imaging. Today I am in the dark because I am in a Bortle 4 zone. Uh, specifically, it's my paragliding school where I go flying pretty much every weekend in the prefecture of Yamanashi to the west of Tokyo. And so I'm kind of in the mountains, but it's still not ideal because the east there's of course the Tokyo Metropolis and the whole light dome there. To the west, we have a large town, uh, like northwest, there's a large town called Kohe. And right to the south of this area here, we have a highway rest area, which is uh, called the, the rest area of Dangozaka. And it's also almost the half moon. But I am still in a waterfall zone, just looking up I see so much more stars than in Tokyo. And so I wanted to see what can I achieve? Is it going to be like just easy for me to get good images uh, from a darker zone? Even though it's not like a, a bottle two, bottle three, it's still like a decent bottle four. And uh, despite the moon, despite like projectors of light coming into my eyes right now, they're very aggressive from the, the highway rest area. I want to see what I can do. So I wanted to bring my uh, Red Cat 51 with the um, ASI 071, or maybe my Ascar V with the Tech IMX uh, 571. Uh, but uh, I had to leave in the hurry in the morning because I had overslept a little bit and I needed to come to the school to fly. <laughs> I did have a very nice two hour long flight. It was really nice. But that means that since I needed something grab and go quickly, I took my two smart telescopes. So the Dwarf Lab uh, Dwarf 2 telescope, which by the way has a new beta firmware that I have available. I don't think it's public yet, uh, but it makes it much better. I'll go very briefly into that in the video. But also, I brought my Seastar S50, which also had a, a firmware update that I added uh, like different speeds for the scrolling, for kind of like manually moving the telescope around. All those two tools getting better is really, really nice. And so I have currently the Dwarf on M31 and I'm gonna put the Seastar on M33 because the Seastar has a much smaller field of view. So it's not very appropriate for large targets like M31. And I just want to see what I can get. Okay. Okay, so I'm currently looking at the interface of my Dwarf Lab Dwarf 2 telescope and you can see M31. Maybe for you guys it's not like impressive or anything, but for me this is absolutely amazing. We have just over five minutes of data, six minutes of data now, and it's just like so visible already. This is so exciting to me. <laughs> I've also taken some uh, dark frames separately so I can uh, hopefully stack this manually later and and process it myself. Uh, if I manage to do that, of course, it's going to be in this video, so stay tuned. Uh, this is super cool. Uh, just quickly, by the way, the, the beta software, it adds a lot of things. Uh, in particular, I cannot show you right now, but it adds a much better autofocus that, that seems to be properly doing a V-curve. It really goes like inside focus, outside of focus, and then suddenly it's in focus. So that's exactly what you would expect from a V-curve algorithm, uh, which is the perfect one for astrophotography. And it worked on a field of stars without any like particularly bright stars. So this is really cool. And also if you go to the uh, function, once you're in the astro mode, um, you have the exposure stuff. But if you change to that little uh, 
cube here, you can see you have uh, the calibration, which is to set up the go-to, which also has become faster, as far as I can tell. Uh, and you also have star target, and here you have proper uh, a proper list that you can search, filter, all that kind of stuff. So all I did is tap on M31 and it go to there without any issues. I feel like this beta firmware really makes the Dwarf Lab uh, Dwarf 2 much better and a bit of a better competitor to the C Star. So it's really good to see competition effectively spurring innovation. And I really hope that Dwarf Lab will be able to release their firmware uh, soon enough and they, it cannot be soon enough because it's uh, it's really a good enhancement and with both the ZW C star and the Dwarf Lab Dwarf 2 telescopes hard at work on their respective targets let's look at how it looks like for the C star Okay, and actually, uh, we the C star has just finished its first five minutes of light accumulation, or basically stacking, live stacking of frames. It's on M33, the Triangulum Galaxy, which is lower than M31 in the sky. They're both both targets are away from the moon, but they're towards the Tokyo sky pollution dome. So it's not like the ideal target and it's not the ideal time either. I really wanted to do this during the full moon but it was unfortunately not possible. So here I am freezing myself off in the half moon but I can see the Milky Way guys. <laughs> it might not be like incredible for most of you. I know that Bortle 4, Bortle 5 is very easily attainable in a lot of uh, American suburbia kind of conditions. But for me, it's, it, it's amazing. <laughs> Anyway, I'm freezing myself off. I'll go in the car uh, and uh, yeah, warm myself up because I need to. And I'm kind of shivering while taking this video. Uh, and yeah, we'll see the results in, in an hour or so. And uh, after that, once I get back home and I have some time, I will be uh, processing those results. I unfortunately have to work today, uh, not tomorrow. Uh, so I will not stay too late here. And here is that parking area from uh, close up. I'm here because the two telescopes are imaging back there and I have some free time so I'm gonna eat because I'm hungry <laughs> but yeah it is very very bright especially those like almost spotlights type of lights oh well I'm done with the imaging and let's give a little uh, summary of what happened so the dwarf two images uh they're gone I lost the micro SD card I have no idea where it is uh, so unfortunately, we'll have to go do without the images of, of M31. So we'll have to use the images from the C star, which are of M33. And I was kind of hoping to see a similar result for several reasons. I took one hour worth of exposures in uh, Uenohara, the place where my paragliding school is. It's a Bortle 4 zone, but M33 at that time was fairly low on the horizon. It was within the light dome of Tokyo. And on the other side, uh, we had the half moon or the 40%, something like that moon uh, that was there uh, being very bright and annoying. And then because of uh, all of the traffic jams, on the way back home, uh, by the time I was taking uh, the same one hour worth of exposures from my rooftop here in Tokyo, the half moon was set, so there was no moon, and the object was much higher in the sky. So I was thinking like, hey, maybe it's gonna like counter itself out, or at least reduce the difference. So did it? Let's have a look at the results that we have on the screen now. And here are the results. You can probably guess which is which. This is with only a photometric color calibration, uh, spectrophotometric color calibration. On the left, we have the image, the image from Tokyo. On the right, we have the image from the Bottle 4 zone. So obviously, we can see a big difference in terms of the details that are available in the image. But also, and this is something that whoever uh, basically processes the images that I took from here, my rooftop, always remarks on it is the background gradients that are very different. And it's one of the reasons that my pictures are much more difficult to process than something taken in a Bortle 4 zone. It's the background 
and the gradients in the background, which should be made easier with something like Graxpert AI, especially now that it can be used directly from within PixInsight. If you want to know how to do that, my friend Luke from the Lucomatico channel made a, made a tutorial video on that. I'll put the link down below if you're interested. But anyway, let's go back to those images and I want to show you how I processed each of them. And the image on the right from the Bordel 4 zone, in all honesty, was much more of a pleasure to process than the image on the left. So I did the usual noise exterminator, blur exterminator, all that kind of stuff, and then some stretching. And let's look at how it is right after stretching the image. Here is how it looks like after stretching the image. I think the difference is even sharper. Um, yeah, the, the backgrounds, I could not get rid of them even with um, Graxpert on the left-hand side image. This is just the na nature of taking images broadband in Tokyo. You get such re like ridiculously hard to deal with gradients. And after that, it was really a matter of doing some masked saturation to kind of like saturate the galaxy while desaturating the background, um, doing uh, curves, transformations, these kind of changes. And this is what we end up with after we do all of the curves transformation changes. And yeah, the this difference is even more obvious. I mean, yeah, it's just like if we zoom into the same region, it's just not the same thing and not the same thing at all. Even the colors have been affected for, for whatever reason. It's almost impressive. Um, so yeah, very, very, very interesting to me. But of course I had a last step, which is reducing the stars. And also I wanted to register the uh, Tokyo image to the Bordel 4 image, just so that we can see with the exact same field of view. And with that, this is how it looks like, right? So <laughs> it's ridiculous how, how different things are. I mean, come on. I, you, you see like in the arms we're losing the color simply because I had to desaturate to some extent and, and I couldn't select the background as well as I could with the image on the right. It's just, it's not only the final image result, it's also like the pleasure that I take in processing the image. It's so much easier with the Bottle 4 zone. I mean, it's not surprising, is it? But it's just for me, I'm not used to doing that. I'm, I'm mind boggled by the difference and I expected less of a difference because of the half moon that I had at the Bordel 4 zone. Because the object was still low on the horizon at the Bordel 4 zone. Because the object was still lost in the Tokyo kind of like sky or light dome in the Bordel 4 zone. But even with all of that, it's just completely different. I also did some like curves changes. I think I went a bit overboard, but you can see like this or, or that, whichever result you prefer. But it's like, it's so different from the image on the left. And so I really want to do an, a similar kind of uh, a test, but with my Red Cat 51 and a cold camera. And I'm thinking about either taking the Red Cat to the Bordel 4 zone and then traveling back to Tokyo and doing the same image from Tokyo on the same night, or basically going to the Bordel 4 zone with my Red Cat and then remote controlling my Ascar V at home, <laughs> which I used for a comparison between the two setups recently. And then, you know, uh, taking the image of the same object at the same time with Bordel 4, where I would be physically remote controlling the Bordel 9. <laughs> telescope at the same time and then comparing at the end. Let me know what you think of that down in the comments and what I should do for the next time that I do such a check. And of course, during a new moon, I want to know all of your ideas for a comparison protocol there. But I think having like the two setups imaging exactly at the same time would be super cool. While you're on your way to the comments, please like the video. Please subscribe to the channel if you're new, in which case, welcome to the channel. If you like astrophotography, I guarantee you won't regret it. You will also get 50% more clear nets. Sorry, this is changing every time, but don't worry, it's all guaranteed. 
And if you want to support me, you can join my Patreon, you can join the channel as a member. It really helps the channel out. Thank you so much to all of my channel members and Patreon supporters. Or if you want something that's at no cost to you and you're planning to buy anything on Amazon or on Agena Astro or on High Point Scientific, you can use the links down in the description. Anyway, I hope that you found this video interesting. Thank you so much for watching as always. But more important than all of that, don't forget whatever you can to look up at the stars, it's pre preferably from a low bottle zone so you have more stars, it's more beautiful. <laughs> and I'll see you next time.